PFCs? Are they, are they the new PC pages? Or wait? Oh, yeah. Start with that. That, that to me is, is a pretty scary molecule. And the, the reason this is a scary molecule is um, the intersecting lines, so those are the carbons. And um, this is um, perfluorooctane sulfonate or PFOS or PFOS. It's, it's a perfluorinated compound. Um, and if, if you look at this, you've got a carbon, carbon backbone and there we go. And all every carbon is bonded only to itself or to fluorine except for the terminal group. And that makes this a, a very stable molecule. It, 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 the carbon fluorine bond is very strong. Um, it, it's does, it doesn't break down, um, and so and so very persistent in the environment. So these, these are part of a class of compounds um, called perfluorinated compounds or perfluoro compounds. I'll be referring to them as PFCs. They're also sometimes called perfluoral alkyl substances or polyfluoral alkyl substances or PFASs. You may see that. It, it, it's bewildering. Um, it's just keeping track of this. Um, and so the other PFC that you'll hear about a lot in the news is perfluorooctanoic acid, or PFOA, or PFOA. Uh, and what, what we care about these, they're really persistent in the environment. They're, they're human-made. They started, they went to manufacture in the 1940s. Uh, they're also water-soluble. Um, so that they're very mobile once they're released. Uh, they, they go into the air, so they can move in the air. And as I said, because they don't break down, once they're released, they stay in the environment. And so, so the, and the result of that, they're, they're globally distributed. I have a few maps here. The, this top map is um, from all kinds of taxa from around the world. And essentially, they found perfluorinated compounds everywhere they look, all, all over the world. Uh, the, the, the bottom, oops, the wrong button here. Bottom map here is, is marine mammals for PFAS, and again, it, it's found all over the world. So, so this, these chemicals are are ubiquitous. Uh, the, the other issue about these things is they're bioaccumulative. Uh, many of them are toxic or teratogenic or mutagenic, like so they're not good for you. Um, and they're also found in people uh, very, at very high frequency. If you do a blood test, chances are uh, you'll find that the, some of these to, to some degree. And finally, they, they have a slow, slow clearing substance. So, so you have these persistent bioaccumulative battery molecules that show up in organisms. Uh, the other thing about this is that, coming back to fish, uh, eating fish is a major, if not the major, route of exposure for people to feed pots. So eat fish, that's how you get feed pots. Um, now, invest, we're kind of early in, in looking at these chemicals in fish. I mean, there's been definitely some research, but they're, they're I would say, still not well characterized and well understood. Um, but some of the things we do know is that perfluorinated compounds behave differently in fish from the way they do from the way some of the legacy contaminants that we're used to looking at, things like polychlorinated biphenyl PCBs or the organochlorine pesticides, things like DDTs, chlordanes, or Myrex, and also mercury. Because the PCBs and the pesticides are lipid soluble, they accumulate in the fat in the fish, so we tend to see those highest in high fat fish like carp. Uh, mercury tends to accumulate in fish that are high in the food chain. So things like uh, high predators like walleye tend to have high mercury. Um, the perfluorinated compounds seem to follow different rules. Um, they, they accumulate in, um, they bind with proteins, so we see them a lot in um, liver and viscera and uh, serum albumin. So we know a little about New York. Uh, in 2006, UN Sinclair, along with a bunch of other folks, mostly from New York State Departments of Health and Environmental Conservation did a survey looking at uh, PFCs in water, in birds, and in fish liver. Again, that's the most um, 
sensitive place to look, it has been most accumulative. And they found, every place they looked, they found fluorinated compounds, including the fish from sort of pristine lakes in the Adirondacks where there, there's no known, no, known, no known source. The, the other, other finding, which we're going to come back to later, is they found, uh, so, so these, these are PFOS um, in, in the fish. Say, so I want to call your attention to this very high level of PFOS sort of near the end of Long Island. Uh, so we'll come back to that later. But another finding that they had was in the Upper Hudson River, PFOA was enriched relative to PFOS. The question is, why do we find this stuff everywhere? It's, it's widely used in a variety of, widely used manufacturing. So I'm standing here in a red rain jacket, and there's a reason for that, and that reason is Cortex, because Cortex is polytetrafluoroethylene PTFD, also known more commonly as Teflon. And it's just Polish whole Teflon. And PFO was used as a solvent in the manufacturing process of Teflon. So there's residual PFO in your particular hands. Uh, it's also used in firefighting foams, so it shows up at airports, fire, airports, firefighting training facilities. It's used in a whole variety of consumer products, including stain repellent. It's also used in food packaging. It, it's basically an anti-grease agent to make paper packaging resistant to grease. There's a um, study just came out this week where researchers looked at uh, fast food wrapper packaging and found the fluorinated compounds in not all of them, but a good number of them. So these things are in the environment. And for, for what it's worth right now, uh, PFOS manufacturers is phased out in the US. PFOA uh, is being phased out, although these com chemicals are still being used elsewhere in the world. And what they're doing is, and this happens with other kind of classes of contaminants, they're substituting very similar chemicals because of those desirable properties, but also possibly they may have the undesirable properties as well. So enough background, I want to start talking about some data and results. In 2010, Larry Skinner wrote a Great, Great, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative grant to the Environmental Protection Agency to look at fish in New York's Great Lakes waters, and among other things, to do a screening study of perfluorinated compounds in fish. And uh, so we looked at Hugh Creek, which is a tributary to the Upper Niagara River. It's also the receiving water of Blood Canal, so it's a heavily polluted, affected by industrial activity. Lake Erie itself, Lake Ontario, and Upper and Lower Niagara River. A variety of species, uh, keys of going left to right, brown bullhead carp, channel cat, Chinook salmon, coho salmon, largemouth bass, lake trout, rock bass, rainbow or steelhead, uh, smallmouth, uh, walleye and white perch. We, our goal was to do typically three individuals, individuals per species, per site. In a few cases we did more. You can see that there's not a whole lot of overlap between species and sites, which impairs our ability to do lots of comparisons. It really was a screening study. Uh, these collections were done by our DC regional staff and the Great Lakes units. The analysis was done by Access Analytical in uh, during British Columbia. They looked at 13 perfluorinated compounds. We have, what's wrong one here? Uh, PFOA here, uh, PFOS here. And those are the numbers of detections out of 80 fish. So the, we, we detected perfluorinated compounds in, we detected seven out of the 13 perfluorinated compounds. Um, up to 78 for PFOS, 78 to 80 fish were detected for PFOS, PFOS I'm sorry. So very widespread. Um, our analysis was of a DEC standard fillet. We're looking at risks for human consumption. Standard fillet is a life life fillet, skin on, including the ribs, and it's all ground up. Uh, the other thing, um, so again, these are class of molecules. So if you look at the, um, the stem here, butanoic, that's four, five, pentanoic. So these, these basically just differ in their chain length. So 
Um, the, this pattern of, and we didn't detect any PFOA, and PFOA tends not to accumulate in fish flesh. Um, so th and th this is uh, pretty common to other studies, so it's, it's consistent. So lo looking more at the results, th these are the individual uh, values, and one thing that got PFOA, PFOS over here, one thing to point out is the maximum axis value here is 80, the others all are 8, so PFOS not only is dominant in frequency, but dominant in magnitude. Uh, the, the one that I'm not showing here is PFOS, so that was the one with two detections. It doesn't seem worthwhile to put a graph up. They, that, those were found in two of the three walleyes in Lake Erie. And what, what I mentioned earlier about not kind of following the standard uh, rank order in which, which fish are most concentrated. Um, our most concentrated fish, if we just look at the peat plot, was uh, rock bass from Cuyahoga Creek. And is it from, and it, it's hard to say, is it because they're rock bass or because it's Cuyahoga Creek? One indication we have is we also got carp from Cuyahoga Creek. And uh, carp we got also from Lake Erie, and th those are pretty comparable between the two sites, uh, but and much higher than in, from the um, upper Niagara River. So you know maybe, maybe there's something going on with rock bass, maybe there's something going on with uh, Cuyahoga Creek. Again, this is just the screening study, just so we're getting an idea what's going on. Um, keep keeping that in mind, though. Wanted to at least consider what this might mean for fish consumption. So on the left panel is the, the mean results by site, uh, rank ordered. So you've got the Cuyahoga Creek rock bass up at the top. I don't know of any guidelines yet that New York State Health has done for these contaminants. So uh, there are numbers from Michigan, which is on the right panel on the top, and Minnesota on, on the left, on the bottom, on the right panel. Uh, these differ somewhat. Michigan is more stringent. What I'd like to focus on are these bulk numbers, um, four meals per month for Michigan or uh, a meal a week for Minnesota, because that's where New York State Health has the maximum device level. That's the general statewide advice. So just comparing those numbers to what we found gives us an idea of where these might fall out in terms of risk for consumption. And if we look at um, the maximum, the more stringent Michigan number, their maximum for four meals a month goes up to 80, 38. Uh, we look here at Cuga Creek, the only one we're exceeding here is the Cuga Creek rock bass. And, and as it turns out, uh, Cuga Creek has a don't eat for everything anyway because it's so contaminated. So, and again, I'm not, just to be very clear, I'm not speaking for the health department but I don't see anything really dire here. They, they will be doing an analysis of this. Uh, the, the other point to make from this, though, is that for fluorinated compound contamination is pervasive in fish. The magnitudes are meaningful with respect to uh, these uh, fish consumption advisory numbers, and but we don't really have a good feeling for what those magnitudes are. This was just a screen study. But we're going to get some, I hope, because we're going to move on to some plans now. Um, as you may know, perfluorinated compounds have been in the news, especially from Eastern New York. Uh, we've got problems with PFOA at Hoosa Falls in Petersburg. There's manufacturing sites there, and uh, Teflon manufacturing, a lot of releases into the water. And at Newburgh, they found PFOS in the drinking water supply. That came from the Stewart Air National Guard base, released through firefighting releases. And uh, there's also a site on Long Island, uh, the Zabriskie Air National Guard base. That's the tip of Long Island. They had PFOS there. So I think that, to go back to St. Clair, that map, I think that's where all that PFOS came from. And again, we had the PFOA in the Newburgh area. Um, if we look here at this map, um, here's our, I'm sorry, people at Petersburg and Hoosick Falls. This is on the Little Hoosick River, going to the Hoosick River, going into the Hudson River up north. So I think 
This is likely a source of the PFOA that Sinclair found in 2006 in the Hudson River water. So we got uh, state Superfund money to analyze fish from the Newburgh site as well as Coosie Falls and Petersburg. Uh, we're doing multiple locations at each site. So we'll move on to here. So this is Coosie Falls. The dark blue is where we're sampling fish. Uh, so, and these are um, a bunch of sites noted, um, manufacturing sites, and it was in the water, uh, sewage treatment water, it falls, so it went in the uh, sewage treatment plant, and so this pond here has very high contaminant levels. This is where we're sampling in the Petersburg area, again, target is PFOA. Uh, we're doing one reference location at each site. So this little Lucic above, um, Taconic Plastics, that's one of the manufacturer sites. So that's our reference site. And we're sampling a bunch of locations in the Newburgh area. Again, a reference site at Browns Pond. And we're doing 10 individuals per site per species. So it's a, it's a big sample size. We're doing two to five sport fish species for human consumption from each of these sites. Uh, typically, most commonly, about three species. And we're also doing one small minnow you know, or other small species just for looking at ecological effects. For the fish that we're analyzing for human consumption, we're doing a three part breakdown. We're doing the ET standard fillet. We're doing the viscera because that's where. Uh, some of these tend to be most concentrated, so it's our most sensitive look. We'll also be doing the remainder of the fish, and that will allow us to mathematically combine the results from these along with the weights to get a whole fish estimate. So again, we can sort of look at the ecological ramifications. DEC in Region 3 and 4 fisheries sampled these uh, October, November. Uh, we've got a pretty good collection. I'm hoping we'll be doing some more uh, this spring, in case we fell a little bit short, fish went out again to access analytical, and we should be getting some results within the next month or so. And the other thing I want to mention about sampling is that because the fluorinated compounds are everywhere, you have to have pretty stringent uh, 